Making good policy recommendations can be really hard. It's a challenging topic in many ways and at many levels because there's always uh, some form of compromise, some form of political issues that will crop up and result in the recommendations you make being you know, more complex than just a simple you know, mathematical exercise of one plus one equals two. There's always complexity in dealing with the real world. And this, the, if something was, uh, if there's an obvious solution to a problem um, that was cheap, it would no doubt already be done. So whenever you're looking at policy recommendations, you, all of the easy things are typically already gone. So in this workshop, we want to, I want to try and unpack ideas around making good policy recommendations. And so I want to just touch briefly on recapping the research question, why are we looking at this topic? An overview of policy analysis and evaluation to give you some broad frameworks for how you're going to carry out particularly the second part of your, well, it's actually both parts of your research. Um, so the frameworks for evaluating effectiveness uh, and some tips for making some good policy recommendations and, and we'll have discussion along the way. We, in discussion before the workshop started, uh, we had some ideas about what people were thinking of doing. And one of the ideas was around uh, protected area management and a topic around you know, trying to identify uh, an area like potentially Lord Howe Island, which has a, an airport that's proposed on it at the moment, and then how you might evaluate the, um, whether that development is a good thing or whether it's consistent with, say, Australia's obligations under the um, World Heritage Convention and other international treaties. So we'll use, let's use that. And if you, if you guys have got any other ideas uh, along the way, if you want to ask you know, questions or suggest what you're thinking of, then let's discuss it. Okay, so uh, can I give you the key points straight up? So rather than saving them up for the end, I just want to say three things to take from this workshop are evaluating the effectiveness of environmental policy is important in the real world and for government. This happens all the time. If you're working for government, particularly if you're in a policy area, looking at you know, what government is doing now or what, you know, what new issues are arising and how we can do it better or what we need to do, that's all policy analysis. It's bread and butter in government. So this is important in the real world. Uh, secondly, your research papers should choose one of the several frameworks for evaluating the effectiveness of environmental policies. So choose something that's clear. We I really want to look for in marking your research papers. I really, it's not so much the outcomes you get. I really want to see the working of how you get there. So a well justified conclusions, showing a clear, logical approach for providing a defensible answer to the the problems is really important, because the, re, the re, dealing with reality and policy analysis. It's easy to be overwhelmed and it's easy just, it's always messy and you can get lost in the mess. So one of your important roles as a policy analyst is to try and work in a logical way to justify why you make certain recommendations. So try within that, the mess of reality, to come up with um, answers that have a um, solid basis to them. and. If you have a framework for your evaluation, that is really going to assist. And third, making good practical policy recommendations that a government will actually adopt is often really hard. Okay, so just to recap, the task you've got for your research paper is this. You've got to evaluate the effectiveness of the implementation of an international environmental regulatory framework in any country of the world and make two or more policy recommendations for how the implementation can be improved. So just looking at your question, or your potential topic about looking at Lord Howe Island and a new airport that's been built on it, then you'd be looking at, so Lord Howe is a World Heritage site, so if the development is going to occur or impact upon, I'm not sure if Lord Howe is entirely, not sure of the extent of the World Heritage site on Lord Howe, but let's just say the development is going to impact on it, then you know, is it consistent with Australia's obligations under the World Heritage Convention? Uh, you know, assessing it in that sort of framework. So there's your international um, framework and then you're using a case study. Y your broad question is how effective is Australia's 
you know, protection of its World Heritage Sites. You're making a case study of this development in Lord Howe Island and evaluating um, Australia's um, implementation of the World Heritage Convention in that context. So you're using a case study to give you some real data of the real world without trying to evaluate all 40 odd sites that Australia, I mean Australia has I think 40 odd sites, World Heritage Sites, so you know in your research paper you couldn't go and evaluate all of them, so choosing one and making a case study of it is a good way to give you a defensible answer to how well Australia is doing. Okay, so that's the first part, evaluating effectiveness. And then the second part is you've got to make two or more policy recommendations for how the implementation can be improved. So a reference I've put up on the Blackboard site is a book that I wrote a decade ago called Does Environmental Law Work? How to Evaluate the Effectiveness of an Environmental Legal System. Chapter two basically deals with a range of methods for policy analysis. It's free, you can just download it, so no cost, it's just a PDF. Um, and yeah, um, so that's a reference. But there's many, basically what the early chapter of my PhD was looking at, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of a legal system? And looked at different frameworks that are used because this task is done by governments, it's done at an international level. An example is the um, Global Environment Outlook, um, GO5. Um, which, you know, it's an evaluation of how well we're doing globally. Yes? Oh, sorry, did I not? Okay, sorry, this was the start. <laughs> Sorry, for those listening to the recording, I didn't put any slide, I didn't project it, so I was talking, displayed on my computer, but I hadn't turned the um, projector across to show my computer. So that was our workshop outline and um, summary of key points that I ran through, recap on the research question, um, that reference that's on the Blackboard site, uh, and that's GO5, the, at least the cover. So the point I've just gotten to is there's a range of approaches for evaluating effectiveness of environmental policies in internationally and nationally. And I just want to pick out some of those. In, you don't need to go and read those. I really want to just summarise some of the key frameworks that you might use and then think about how you make good policy recommendations. So uh, another reference if you were looking at um, particularly protected areas and, and effective management. There was a recent report, the Protected Planet Report. Uh, I put the link up on the Blackboard site as well and it's got a chapter five, just a few pages with a whole heap of references to evaluation frameworks. So as I say, it's really common for governments to ask themselves how well are we doing, to review their policies to try and come up with better ways, more efficient ways of doing what they're doing, just bread and butter stuff. So there's a lot of work in this whole area of policy analysis. And yeah, so if we focus in on your research task, you've got to evaluate the effectiveness and policy. So there are three key words. Can I just unpack those a little bit? So evaluate is to ascertain the value of something or appraise it carefully. I mean, you do that all the time. So, you know, someone cooks you a meal and you eat it, you know, do you like it or not? You're evaluating it, mm, yeah, this is really yummy, thanks, this is great, I love this, you cooked it so well, or God, this tastes terrible, I'm just about gonna be sick. That's an evaluation. So working out the value of something, do you like it or not, is it good or bad? That's what you're, I'm not asking you to describe it, that's what I'd like to distinguish. I don't want you to just say, say in the Lord Howe Island example, I don't want you to just say, okay, Australia is a party to the World Heritage Convention, it has uh, enacted these laws, and the development is being done under those laws. Like that would be just a description of the framework without saying, going on to say how well the laws are being implemented to achieve the obligations. So don't just be descriptive, you actually need to say something about how well it's doing. Because it, yeah. Um, I know as a lawyer, a lot of legal writing is purely descriptive. Lawyers very 
relatively rarely evaluate. We tend to be very much back in the descriptive stage. This is what the law says uh, without saying, and it's good for these reasons, or it's working for these reasons. So you need to evaluate, don't just describe the problem. Effectiveness basically means whether it's achieving its purpose or producing the intended result. So, you know, is it, is it effective? Is it, is it achieving what it's intended to do? So that depends on, you know, what the objective is. So for the Ramsar Convention, what's its objective? Yep, to protect wetlands of international significance. So, for instance, if there is, you know, some massive development out in a desert miles from any wetlands, the, wet, the Ramsar Convention really isn't concerned with that issue. Like on the face of it, there doesn't seem to be any relevance to the Ramsar Convention. Um, so, whether something is effective depends upon its purpose. So, yeah, effectiveness can be seen as a measure of how successful the law is in solving the problem it was designed to address. And I've emphasised already that it's never a black and white. It's been 100% successful or 0% successful. It's always going to be some in between. And often it's, it's very difficult to determine whether the law or policy was the cause of the, you know, the beneficial outcome. If we just think about it, say, uh, something that we're all familiar with, like crime. The fact that there is a legal system and we have a relatively low crime rate, is the legal system that causes the low crime rate? Or is it the overall socio-economic situation? Because we're a relatively rich society, people don't need to go and steal. So if there was, you know, if the economy in Australia collapsed and we had the same legal system, would you expect more crime like theft? The answer would be, yeah, you probably would. So the legal system isn't the only determiner of what are the crime rates. There are a whole range of other factors. So working out how effective the legal, like the criminal legal system is in deterring crime is actually quite hard because there are other factors other than just... And similarly with the environmental legal system, it's not just the law that determines whether it's effective or not. So one of the key... Um, determiners of whether environmental laws are effective or not is often just population pressure. So you might have a really weak legal system, you know, in a country that's quite remote with a low population and, you know, the environment is really high quality. You know, there's fresh water, there's a whole range of, you know, fish to, you know, eat, everything's great. If you increase that population from, say, 10,000 to 10 million, suddenly the same environment, probably, let's just say, with the same legal system, and but suddenly there's radically different um, outcomes. Um, so is the legal system then being ineffective? Well, it hasn't changed. Even though there's greater pressure, you would say, yes, it's being ineffective. But you can see it's not just the legal system. Similarly, in a country, say, like China, where there's a huge population pressure, the fact that it has terrible air pollution problems in places like Beijing, yeah, is that a failure of the legal system and the governance? Yes. But population pressure is just, you know, makes it so difficult to, to manage. So um, often working out whether something is effective is quite difficult. And it's never just a sole cause and effect, or rarely is it a sole cause and effect. So in terms of policies, I want to use policy broadly as any position taken or communicated by government um, and that sort of recognise a problem and in general what can be done about it. So, uh, so sustainable development, for instance, is a widely adopted um, policy by government, uh, integrating environmental considerations into decision making. So that's a policy. Um, can I give you an overview of policy analysis? Because there's this whole field of research around policy analysis and evaluation. So in terms of the big picture, you can think about policy a bit like an environmental policy, a bit like um, uh, solving a jigsaw. Because there's all these bits that are going on. You know, if, you've got, if you're trying to deal with, say, air pollution in Beijing, there's all of these bits that you need to deal with. There's the population issues, there's transport, there's energy. 
um, policy. There's all of these things going on. And so trying to build up a system to, to address it has got all of these parts that are moving. So it's not just a static jigsaw. And in fact, it's a jigsaw often where you don't even have the picture of what you're trying to build. You're trying to build up the pieces of this system um, with an overall outcome, but you know, in time and space. So it's, it's very difficult and many, many moving parts. A key idea that I've found really valuable is to not to get away from thinking of um, environmental policy as like build something like a building and then you know you've solved the problem because that's not how environmental policy works. Environmental policy is much more like gardening, and we basically work on you know what we've in inherited from people that came before us, and we cultivate you know, new policies and then we hand it on to people that will come after it. So this comes from a quote from a fellow called um, Bartlett. He was a professor, Richard Bartlett, in the US. Um, did a lot of work on policy analysis. And yeah, I really like this quote from him. Environmental policy isn't an engine, often isn't an engineering problem that you can just build something and, you know, it's solved. Um, things are constantly changing. You know, population pressures change. Uh, different technologies give different impacts. Things build up over time. There's lags in time and space. There's all of these things going on that we never actually solve problems in the sense that it's fixed. You can walk away and leave it. Like you think about, say, managing a water catchment. You don't just, you know, put in a dam, put in a few fields, and then walk away and leave it, and it's all just looks after itself. There's ongoing management of the dam. There's ongoing management of the fields. You've got to address sort of pollution issues and the like as you go along. So gardening is a much better example. You know, like you wouldn't think of gardening. You just like throw a few seeds in the soil and then walk away and come back in six months' time and you expect to have a massive crop. Well, if you haven't done any weeding, you haven't done any watering, your crop may well have just died. Gardening is much more, you know, get in, cultivate, grow it, water it, um, reap the crop and then replant. So environmental policy is much more that if you're looking for an overall metaphor for what we're doing. So this image, I really like. Think of yourself as a gardener that you're actually cultivating and improving, but you're never just going to solve and walk away from like your garden. So yeah, think of working in environmental policy like working in a garden and your career in environmental policy is like a gardener. So some useful references for policy analysis. Um, I think I put the link up to this. A useful reference was this UNEP 2017 Strengthening the Science Policy Interface, a gap analysis. I found this really interesting. If I haven't put the link up, I will put it up on Blackboard site, but you can easily just search for it. And they had this diagram, which I thought was useful, about the complex interactions between policy. So you've got there something like you know a natural scientist or a policy maker domestic environmental officials, implementers, politicians, business, consultants, civil society, um, non-environmental officials, the media, and their yeah, beliefs, and they're all interacting. So it's a really complicated, it's not just scientists working out, okay, we've got to do this, let's go and do it. There's obviously a big political forces involved and a whole range of factors like the media. So and a great example of that is the Murray-Darling Basin and the catastrophe that we've had in planning for that. So, um, yeah, just the work that was done to try and better plan for the Murray-Darling and then when they released the plan and the idea that we were actually going to restrict some water from going to farmers led to, you know, virtual riots from the farmers to the point where they took the scientists and the policy makers who had prepared this policy, the first Murray-Darling Basin Plan, they took them all out the back of a building and they shot them all um, and they buried them. Not quite, um, but the first lot all resigned and then a new lot came in and they came up with a weaker plan and now we've got you know massive fish kills occurring in the Murray-Darling Basin and there's no simple answer for how we fix it because politically we're in this morass where we can't go forward because the political debate is so toxic. Uh, yep. So the Murray-Darling is a you know, good example of environmental, of environmental policy gone badly wrong. And in that report it talked about, the mess, about mess and complexity and I thought this was a really interesting section. 
about uh, how it's often forgotten that policy making is messy. Although a tidy, analytically driven cycle of policy making might seem logical to scientists trained in a traditional hypothesis generation and testing, policy making is, inst is instead a network process in which scientific evidence is only one of many inputs. And yeah, it's messy. So there's books like this uh, book, Environment and Sustainability Policy Handbook, which you can get in the library. Um, Stephen Dovers, Karen Hussey is a professor here at UQ, really lovely lady. Um, works in the building just beside us here in the Global Change Institute. And she's got a Centre for Policy Excellence. So she's a really lovely professor here. And in that book, you'll see things like this, the policy cycle, the idea that, um, see down the bottom, we identify an issue. We identify an issue. We analyse, well, what can we do about it? Um, we think about what we're going to do about it. We're going to have a law. We're going to educate. We're going to put money into research. What are the things we could do? Um, consult with industry and other stakeholders. We coordinate across government what we're going to do. We decide, okay, we're going to have a new law. So we then enact a new law and we implement it. And then after a while, we evaluate how well we're doing and go back to have we solved the issues. So that's the classic policy cycle, really famous in terms of policy analysis. It's nice and neat, and my partner uh, who works in policy, she like looks at this and she just laughs and she just says, it's never like that. Um, true, it's never like that, but it's also useful to have these sorts of things in mind. So uh, at least at a theoretical level, it's useful to think of it as, okay, well, we're going to implement something and then we're going to come back and evaluate it and work out whether we're doing, so plan to have evaluations. You don't just set it, set it and then just forget about it and walk away. So the idea that you're gonna come back and evaluate it and think about how to do it better, that's useful. So policy instruments are the tools that you might use to achieve a government policy. And there's some classic ones that are recognized, things like command and control or direct regulation. So laws backed by sanctions, so that you require a license to build an airport, for instance. Let's just say for the Lord Howe Island example. So there's a law there saying you need, a, you need approval to build an airport. Um, you need approval under planning laws to construct the airport. There might be several laws that prohibit you doing something unless you have an approval. So that's your command and control sort of approach, really common. Also self-regulation. So if government decides it's not gonna regulate, it's just gonna leave it up to industry. Um, voluntary measures are also something. So often we'll say to people, you know, don't litter, put it in the bin. Um, yeah, there might be fines for littering, but really we work on it being more voluntary. Um, education, so we might, in terms of that littering example, we might, one of the best um, ads I have ever seen, I remember it um, to this day, it was about 15 years ago I saw it, or 20 years ago I saw it. It was on in a bus shelter uh, here in Brisbane, and it was an ad that was put up by the Brisbane City Council and it was this black and white picture, so in the side of a bus shelter about, you know, this big picture of, it was in black and white, it was this dead pelican that had this garbage bag wrapped around its neck and it, had, it was dead. And the poster read, when you miss the bin, you hit the bay. And I just thought it was such a powerful message about not littering, so not putting rubbish that gets into waterways that then goes and kills things. See, it was a horrible picture, but it really struck me. So that's an education campaign. And it's a measure, a policy measure that government can use. And that might be a sort of measure that, you know, you guys, if you're looking at an area that's, um, you know, involving politically sensitive issues, education is often a measure that's often easy to recommend because it's non-confrontational, whereas if you're recommending laws, particularly if it's going to affect private property rights, that's immediately got political implications, whereas education and um, economic instruments, so like a tax or something like that, um, free market, does it have research there? No. Um, education and research, yeah, so research is another policy measure. It's easy to recommend, uh, okay, well, there's a problem, we don't know the extent of it, we should do some more research, government should fund further research. That's easy to recommend because no one's going to really object to it. Scientists are going to be happy to get more money. You haven't infringed any private property rights at this stage, so farmers and the like aren't going to object to it. 
as long as you can get the money from government, if you keep the numbers low, government can give money to it and it looks like they're doing something. So research, education, they're the easy ones. Okay, in terms of our policy goals, I focused you on looking at effectiveness, but often in terms of policy analysis, people talk about effectiveness, whether it achieves the outcomes that it's intended to. Also, efficiency and cost effectiveness is a big thing. So are you achieving them at you know, the least cost or you know, in an efficient way? And then is it equitable? So you know, are you, if the law applies, you know, there's no racial discrimination or discrimination based on um, sex or you know, if you only applied the law to you know, male farmers, then it would clearly be inequitable um, or to one particular racial group. So. Um, is it equitable? Uh, also in terms of socio-economic status, so if you only applied a law that affected poor farmers, then that would probably also be inequitable, unless you had a good, really good justification for it. Uh, and then also another thing is whether it's politically acceptable. So, um, so in terms of frameworks for evaluating effectiveness, the one I used in and talked about in my book and is widely used is called State of Environment Reporting. You don't have to use it as your framework. It can be useful depending on the problem that you're looking at. So State of Environment Reporting is widely used around the world. Um, since the 1960s in the US, uh, they've had a National Environmental Policy Act which required environmental quality reports. And then the OECD in the 1970s recommended periodic national reports on the state of the environment and then Australia started doing that. So this pressure state response method was the broad framework that was developed to use for those sorts of reports. So you look at pressures like say fishing activity, then you look at the condition. So let's just say the southern bluefin tuna um, problem that we looked at in uh, the previous lecture. So the pressure is the fishing activity. Um, targeting southern bluefin tuna. The condition, you look at this current state but also the trend in the part of the environment you're evaluating. So we know that the fish biomass for southern bluefin tuna has collapsed since the 60s to about 10% of its original biomass. So the condition is it's quite degraded, you know, very reduced and in danger of basically pushing the entire population to extinction or ecological extinction. And then the response, you then look at, well, there's the southern bluefin tuna, um, the con conservation, sorry, the convention on the conservation of southern bluefin tuna. And then to evaluate it, you, you ask, well, is that not just, if we just stop there, it would just be descriptive, but we evaluate it by saying, well, how well is the convention solving the problem of restoring the, um, or protecting the southern bluefin tuna? And so we could look at some of the graphs we looked at in the lecture and say, well, it's doing, it seems to be effective, um, but, um, yeah, well, I, I think you'd say it seems to be effective. It's maintaining the population at least at a stable level. It's not driving to extinction and it's allowing for a slow recovery. So on balance, you know, in terms of zero to 10, you might give it a six or a seven. It's not a 10 out of 10 because the, the stock is still very reduced, but in terms of that gradual, is it failing or is it succeeding, I would say with that it's more succeeding than failing. Do you guys agree from what we looked at in that lecture? So that's pressure state response, state of environment really widely used. Um, and then there's variations on it. So in Australia and in Queensland we've got state of environment reports that use that sort of framework. The objectives are to report and, and evaluate effectiveness. So as I said, this sort of thing that you're doing for your research paper is bread and butter for government and if you're working in policy in different government departments or local government. Um, so that's the basic framework, pressure state response. Environmental indicators are often used in that because the, the world is so complex that you'll often look at a few key indicators. So for greenhouse, we look at like the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we know that it's gone up to what about 404 parts per million and is continuing to go up. So that's an indicator. Similarly the mean global temperature we're using as an indicator of climate change. Climate change is actually a whole heap of things but we're using that measure as you know a 
uh, an indicator, yeah. So an indicator is often used for southern bluefin tuna. What would be the indicator? If we're evaluating it, yeah. Yeah, the biomass, the estimate of how much fish is left, that would be the key indicator that you would want. You know, you're not going to have an indicator like, um, just as an ex a silly example, but you know, you're not looking at, say, the number of um, great white sharks that, you know, are hunting um, southern bluefin tuna, which would be a really, might be a really indirect indicator because, you know, if there's more fish, they might attract more sharks. But it's a pretty silly indicator. Why wouldn't you just look at directly at the southern bluefin tuna than something else? So there are other indicators you can use. Um, so, and the example that we looked at before of the Rhine, you know, the recovery, what was the indicator they were using there? Salmon. Why did they use salmon? They were sensitive to water quality, but why not? You know, there was probably some little mollusk that they could have chosen that was also very sensitive to water quality. Why didn't they just choose a little black snail? They're harder to find and measure? Public perception. The salmon's a lot sexier. You know, people like salmon. They looked in that picture I showed you, look great, you know? Like, who doesn't? I'm, I mean, I'm a vegetarian, I'm not interested in eating them. But, you know, they're a great fish. I think it would be great to see a salmon in a river. I'd be so ecstatic. Whereas, much as I like the little black snail, I'm not as excited about that. So, you know, you can choose an indicator, and that's smart. You know, choosing an indicator that's, um, you know, sexy, interesting from a, uh, you know, public perception. So choose an indicator like that that's, you know, gets people interested and actually is also a good indicator of water quality because they are sensitive to water quality. So if they come back, it's actually a really good physical indicator that people can see, hey, we've got salmon back. And that's also why they're looking for an indicator for can you swim in the Rhine? Because that's an immediate human benefit. So you might measure that in terms of a whole range of things like, you know, fecal content, levels of, you know, pesticides and the like. There might be 50 different things that you might measure uh, that you would then say it's safe to swim in the Rhine or not. But that's your indicator. You might have a whole heap of things feeding into it. So indicators are really valuable. So for your evaluation, uh, I'm just thinking about a couple of other examples we've used. Um, yesterday, Candy's example, we were talking about uh, air quality in Beijing. So you know, what are the sort of indicators you might use there? So there's the, what is it, the um, uh, pollutants at 2.5, was it 2.5 ppm? Yeah, so you might look at, you know, the levels of, you know, that's a good indicator of pollution, and you might look at the measurements in Beijing air quality of ppm 2.5 or ppm 10 over time, and then you would judge on whether you're being successful or not based on you know the graph over time. So if the pollution levels were falling, you would say, well, what we're doing is being effective. And if they're increasing, then obviously we're not doing enough. So there's a good indicator. Cool? OK, so indicators, really commonly used. Um, so some form of risk assessment is also common. So if, say, you want to look at a an area, let's just say you're looking at, um, say, a coral reef. Let's just say you're looking at the Great Barrier Reef, you want to evaluate it. And you know that there are a number of pressures on the Great Barrier Reef from climate change, from land source pollution, from fishing, from... Let's just say indigenous hunting, or that, that's a form of fishing, but let's just say indigenous hunting is another pressure. Um, so let's just say you've got those four pressures and in terms of, you know, for your evaluation of it, you've got to narrow down and focus on, say, the most significant pressures. So what would you think of those are the most significant pressures? Climate change, um, fishing, um, water pollution or indigenous hunting? Climate change? Yep, so it's large scale, potentially looks like it's going to have catastrophic impacts. Water quality is also very significant. What about indigenous hunting? Things like dugong and turtles. It's a pressure, 
but in the scheme of things, it's relatively trivial. So if you were wanting to evaluate the effectiveness of managing the Great Barrier Reef, let's just say that was your broad question, you might identify the range of pressures and then go on to basically do a risk assessment to say in this evaluation we're going to focus on water quality. It's not the greatest pressure because that's climate change but water quality is still significant. We're going to ignore indigenous hunting because that's a relatively small scale pressure. So you identify and then it justifies you going on to look at water quality. Does that make sense? Okay, there's variations of state of environment reporting that you see in different reports. So this is a variation of it, so the DIPSAR method. So notice here there's pressure, state, and response. So there's still that PSR, but they've brought in a couple of extra things, driving forces and impact. And the sort of things you talk about in driving forces might be something like population increase. Uh, and then the pressure might be sort of farming or fishing. Uh, I personally don't find that method that useful because it's hard to, I think, separate out driving forces and pressures. I pre prefer to bring driving pre forces into pressures and assimilate impacts and state is often difficult to tease out what you actually mean. I prefer the simpler framework, but this is used quite a lot in Europe. Um, it's also been adopted in a, you know, some recent um, state of environment reports here in Queensland. You can see there pressures, whoops, state, uh, impacts, um, driving forces, whoops, and responses. So that's that DIPSAR method. And then these are the Global Environment Outlook reports. So can I just try and unpack this a bit? I know this looks complex, but see here there's pressures, um, state, and trends, uh, impacts, and responses, and here's the drivers. So it's basically that, and then they have local, regional, and global scales. So that looks a lot more complicated, but it's actually the same elements that you're just building up. And the reason why, why do you have one of these frameworks if you're trying to evaluate policy? Why do they set out a framework like this, and why is it useful for you in your evaluation? Because this whole situation is so messy, unless you start to try and categorise things and say, okay, well, this is what's causing the problem. This is, if you then talking about the environment, do you mean, you know, what do you mean by the environment as opposed to what's causing it? Uh, and then, you know, what are you doing about it? So by separating out a few things, you're trying to make, organise a bit the messy world. Okay. A framework that I want to draw to your attention, if you're looking at a protected area, is this IUCN framework for evaluating effectiveness um, in protected areas. Uh, it was uh, one of the lead authors of the 2006 version of it was Mark Hawkins, who used to is retired. He's a, I think he's an emeritus professor still here with the School of Earth and Environmental Science. Really nice um, fellow, and he's still heavily involved in World Heritage management and um, conservation planning. So um, Mark's work um, was published by the IUCN, Mark and other authors, and they basically, you can see here, um, it's just a more detailed context, planning, inputs, process, outputs, outcomes, and they have criteria. Um, so it's a, uh, and here's his framework, root causes, threat, and impact. And the examples they give there are like poverty in nearby community, the threat is unsustainable hunting in the protected area, and the impact is reduction in animal populations. So uh, you can see they're coming up with a framework to evaluate the effectiveness of protected areas. So threats and barriers to effective management, I'm not going to go through that big table, but that's a useful reference. So if you are looking at something like the Ramsar Convention, um, you know, and you wanted to look at something like Moreton Bay, you could choose something like pressure state response, or you could choose something like um, Mark Hocking's framework, the IECN framework. Just choose a framework and then try and apply it. So it's a reference for your work and you can then, it, it will really help you make your ideas, um, instead of just like ideas sort of going off in all different directions, hopefully it helps you marshal things together in a logical analysis. Does that make sense? And, and this is the useful thing where you're building upon work of others, which is you know, one of the key things we try and do 
in an academic sense, we look around at other good ideas and we adopt them, we reference them, and then we apply them to solve real world problems. So this is you know, some good references that then you can use to solve real world problems. Okay, um, yeah, I won't go into that. It's a really useful framework um, and aimed at you know, being able to be used in you know, any social context, so it's not really that jargon heavy. It's aimed at you know, countries where the, you know, the managers of national parks um, might have very low levels of education and they're trying to help them to improve the management, to look at what are the problems, how they can improve it, what they should do to have an effectively managed protected area. And then, yeah, four phases, improve management, um, analyze, yeah, phase one, define evaluation objectives, phase two, develop methodology, phase three, implement evaluation, and phase four, analyze, communicate, and implement results. And, yeah, so, probably already done this as we're going along, but uh, if you were looking at something like, um, say, Candy's example that we talked about yesterday, where she was looking at air quality in Beijing, then she might use something like the pressure state response framework because it's pretty simple in that sort of case. The pressures she could look on as, you know, the sources of pollution in Beijing. So um, industry, um, coal-fired power generation, uh, vehicles, you know, all of these sources, get some numbers on that, what are the biggest of them. Then the condition, so, you know, some measures of what's happening to the pollutants in Beijing, and then looking at the response, what has been done at a national uh, and sub-national level, all levels of government and education of the community to try and improve air quality. So things like, you know, moving, you know, promoting renewable energy, trying to move coal-fired power generators and coal burning outside of the Beijing region. So uh, moving to cleaner energy, also moving, <coughs> moving away from um, petrol and diesel driven vehicles <coughs> so that you have uh, electric vehicles. I read this figure that um, is it last year, uh, China purchased something like 300,000 electric vehicles and the rest of the world purchased like 12 or something. It was some ridiculous number of electric buses. So you just think of that, you know, if you can take 10,000 buses off the road, actually, well, you're not taking them off the road, are you? You're, if, you, if they're, you know, charging from power that's generated from outside the region, and then you're just driving them around based on battery power and you remove 10,000 um, buses that are emitting pollution from your city, then you know, that's going to have an impact on air quality. Uh, so, so pressure state response might be good for her, but, it, but for others, if you're looking at, say, the idea of um, uh, the impacts of that um, uh, airport in... Lord Howe, um, you could use one of the other frameworks. Yep, got a question? Um, just based on those kind of recommendations you suggest there about potentially moving power generation away and stuff like that, that's fairly complex and unwieldy and potentially expensive and stuff like that. Should our recommendations that we make take into account economic considerations? Like uh, absolutely. Uh, so. Um, I actually rec I, I mention that merely because it's something that's actually being done in yeah. you know in China because it's a huge problem. Um, the, the, those sorts of things are already being done. Uh, but yeah, certainly economics. I'll get on to actually. I'll move on to um, you know tips for making good policy recommendations. But yeah, the weighing up what's practical and what will actually be implemented is really important to do. So tips for making good policy recommendations, make them as clear and specific as possible. So a numbered list is very helpful. So I highly recommend in your um, report, you plan, or you know, your research papers, plan to have, I would just go with the report format that we've talked about. Don't try and write a scientific article unless you're really keen on trying to publish. Just go for a report, so have a cover page with the title, your name, you know, a picture of what you're looking at. A second page with a table of contents and then you know the introduction you know some maps and pictures of the area you're, you're looking at 
set out your methodology, so have a methodology section, then you know, look at um, analyzing some real world data, you know, a case study or something like that, and then um, analyze, you know, once you've done that analysis, have some recommendations and have a recommendation section where you try and have a numbered list. Because the key thing I would say is the more, the clearer you can make, and the clearer and more specific you can make your recommendations, the more likely they are to be implemented. If, you're, if what you're recommending is so vague that it's difficult to understand, then even if someone reads your report, if they don't really understand what you're telling them to do, it's understandable that they're not going to do what you think is the best thing. So you've got to make it clear. So a numbered list of recommendations is a really good thing to aim at. And um, yeah, so make them clear and specific, have a numbered list, base them on the evidence presented in your paper, uh, ensure they're practical and politically acceptable. So that comes down to the numbers question and economics. Um, there's some examples I've put up on the website um, of published papers that um, have clear and specific recommendations. So this was a public by Winarski, he was looking at these extinctions on uh, three extinctions of species um, in recent times on Australian um, islands, and yeah, basically won't dwell on the details. But these three species went extinct, and he had recommendations numbered one to fifteen. Um, number one, recommendations to prevent species extinctions drawn from the review of three extinctions. So as a fundamental objective, environmental legislation and policy explicitly seeks to prevent extinction of any species. Two, policy and legislation provide a clear chain of accountability for prevention of extinction. Three, policy and legislation provide an explicit requirement for retrospective public inquiry following any extinction equivalent to a coroner's inquest. It's actually a really good, powerful, specific, it's clear what he means, clear what he suggests should be done. Um, so that's an example of good, clear, specific recommendations. Yep? Um, are we trying to look at like, what the pushback might be in the commissioner's recommendations? Great question. I'm going to shower you with lollies because I'm going to go on to the next slide that I've thought about a lot, um, which is policy recommendations can span a spectrum of practicality, cost, difficulty and political acceptability. So, and I've drawn it this way with a dotted line in the middle. So there's very practical, low cost, easy to achieve and likely to be strongly supported. Those are the politically acceptable. So recommendations, those are easy to make. So a recommendation for further research, uh, you know, like let's just say you were looking at pollution in a particular area, further research, that's an easy one to make, particularly if it's not very expensive research because no one is offended by it. You're not impacting upon anyone's activities, as opposed to shut down like the whole coal sector, uh, that there's a lot of cost with that, and it's difficult to implement. There'll be legal rights that you know, the coal sector has, so it becomes politically unacceptable quite quickly. And there's a spectrum of this. So have it, you want to think about that in your papers, you might deliberately shy away from talking about political acceptability, because most people do. Um, I've thought about this a lot for having written reports for government, and I think that often we self-censor. Um, you have to weigh up the importance of the recommendation against the blowback to it, whether it's politically unpalatable. I know with you might think it's important, but feel that if, you get, if they're going to disregard your report, then you don't put it in. So an example, you know, in terms of water management, um, I was talking about the Murray-Darling, you know, the political blowback for, from, rep, you know, recommending, for instance, that there should be a buyback of, say, major water licences, uh, and then that just be returned to the environment. You know, that just makes it politically very difficult to make. And, yeah, the tricky politics of those sorts of things mean that it's, yeah, hard. Here's an example. I did a consultancy with some colleagues here about policy recommendations dealing with basically um, ponded pastures in the Queensland catchment. So um, basically, see, this is up um, near Bundaberg, I think, and see in the foreground of that picture, there's this wall that's been built, and it's stopping water getting down to the estuary. 
So they've been extensively built in coastal areas and they're called ponded pastures, um, built decades ago, big impacts on fisheries. And so we were looking at how they might be better regulated. And at the time, the political context was a state government that was basically anti any more regulation. And we had, we were directed not to make any recommendations um, or not to be specific. And our draft was altered <laughs> um, without our consent. So this was our final draft by our authors. We recommended that Grumper approach the management restoration of fish passage in a similar manage similar manage as it did when pork water quality from coastal development and farming was identified as a key pressure, etc. a long-term collaborative approach. We specifically avoided making any recommendations around increased laws because we knew it wouldn't get accepted. So we avoided that. Our recommendation was just basically to engage in a long-term collaborative approach, thinking, you know, that's pretty benign. That got changed from notice that it's basically the same. Instead of being recommendations, Grumper and the Depar Federal Department of Environment um, put it out under our name to um, change recommendations to potential management actions. Notice it's weaker. And instead of we recommend that, actions that could be taken, if you want to, because you know you feel like it on the day, or if you don't, it doesn't matter. We don't really know. Um, and instead of it being Grumper, so we're identifying who should take the step and what they should do, the restoration of fish pastures in the Great Barrier Reef could be managed in a similar manner. So there's no one identified that's responsible for this. And it's not really even clear whether you, you could do it, you might do it, you don't have to do it. Who knows? So anyway, I just use that as an example of uh, often as a consultant, you will self-censor and then you basically get your report rewritten by a government department. Um, and it's bloody frustrating. Um, but yeah, the, often the choice is, well, unless you accept our recommendations to, or, you know, your, our edits, you know, we're not accepting your report. And so you will self-censor to basically meet what the government of the day will accept. And you might try and push the boundary a bit, but yeah, sometimes you just jump over the line. I, I won't go into this. We just jumped over the line with that one because said they should basically do things that they wouldn't possibly want to do, but because the science was saying that. So in your paper, I'm not saying to, uh, you probably don't need to deal with the politics at all because it's always risky when you start to talk about it, political acceptability. It sort of makes your paper look unscientific, but they are real considerations in the real world about what a government will accept. And often those are just not expressly addressed in your report. Uh, it, it will just be a series of recommendations that sort of appear out of the air and you don't really clearly say, well, we didn't make this recommendation because you didn't, we thought it would be important, but we knew you'd never accept it because you're a bunch of, you're not going to say that. Um, so, yeah, look, political context, if it was something like, let's go back with something that's safe, like um, the Beijing and air pollution example, there's so much public pressure on the government of China to do something about air pollution because it is affecting millions of people. So even though it's a regime where it's not a democracy, it's still, it's huge public pressure on that and the government is wanting to respond to it. So there is a level of political acceptability about addressing this issue and taking measures and the government of China is already doing things. So in terms of political acceptability for that, then, you know, making recommendations that are based on good evidence, it's the sort of thing where you can actually make recommendations that, you know, um, Whereas if you were looking at, say, the, say the coal sector here in Queensland, uh, and you know, my recommendation would be for climate change, we should just shut it down, um, pretty well move out of coal within the next five years, try and protect the reef. Um, but obviously that, that is completely unacceptable to state and federal governments. So there's no way they would accept you know, any sort of constraint on coal development. Yep. So like in Australia, the main source of energy is oil shale. Yep. Yep, so you're looking at yeah, Estonia and oil shale, and I think you face the same sort of political problems. 
It depends also who your target audience might be. Like if you are not writing for the Estonian government, but you're just writing broadly for the general public to inform them about you know, what might be done, then uh, you might have broader recommendations. But if you're writing, if you're a consultant for the government, you are very aware of the political context and you will often self-censor. That's my experience. I think that that's just routine for both government and you know, if you're a government policy analyst, you know what the government wants. You're, you, know, you read the media, you hear what your minister is saying, you know what the premier or the prime minister, what they are spruiking at the time. You know what the politics are around the policies you're working on and you try and come up with things that address their, what they want. So politics is a, you know, a big part of this. Okay, so just wrapping up, any questions on that? So the key things, for thinking about the policy recommendations are um, use a framework like pressure state response or the Hawking's IUCN approach if you're looking at a protected area. There's other frameworks that are out there. Uh, I've given some references. Um, there's a chapter that I've dealt with in my book. Um, if you're struggling to find a framework, come and have a talk with me. I just want you to identify something clearly and then develop your policy recommendations based around, you know, it might be education, it might be more research, it might be, you know, something more constraining than that, but it need, your recommendations need to be based upon the evidence you present in your paper, and so you've got to identify a problem and uh, then make a recommendation based on that. And if you have a gap, for instance, you're finding it difficult to find information about an issue, then that can, if you find a gap, I mean, as long as you can get enough to say something sensible in your paper, but if there's a lack of information, then what could be one of your recommendations? There needs to be more research on this. There needs to be more research published uh, about this. The government needs to do more research on this, you know, and that needs to be published to inform the community. So, um, you know, a, a, a gap, is also an opportunity for a recommendation for you, so don't be put off by that. Yes? Um, should we in our report mention who we're targeting as the audience? Is this for the government or is it for the government? It's important to think about who your audience are. So you saw in that report where we identified the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority as the person that, or the entity that needed to take the step. So you need to be aware about the levels of government and who would be the relevant decision maker and it's good if you can try and identify them. So if it's a local government, you know, that needs to take the step or that's in that system, they're the ones that handle this, then, you know, your recommendations should be targeted at them. Or, so identifying who your target audience is is important. Is it just other scientists? Is it the government? Is it local government? Important to think through at least. Other questions? Yes? Uh, if we're using a case study uh, and based on the problems that are found in that case study, but there might be broader problems for a whole, for example, if I was doing well, what I'm thinking about is the wet tropics or heritage area problems yep. in there. And so maybe one area has certain problems, but there are broader problems for the whole thing. Do we just make policy recommendations based on our case study area? It's important with case studies. Case studies are best if they can be representative. So like in, I told you about my PhD where I focused on one catchment. I was looking at the Great Barrier Reef, but I focused on a catchment and I said, this is representative of other, other catchments. So basically I then, case, case studies are often said to be looking at a big problem through a small lens. So that's, but the beauty of them is that they allow you get, to get into the real world complexity so if you can try and have a case study that's representative, then you can justify recommendations related to more, broad, more broadly how this problem is addressed in other areas. So does that make sense? Okay, I'm conscious of time. Really happy to discuss this further with you as we go along. Um, if you haven't dealt with policy before, I hope that's a useful introduction. And I hope also that you see that this is actually really you know, this is useful for you in your future careers, whether you're working in government 
or if you're working in industry because you know industries are always looking for how they can improve their processes so looking at the problems you've got and then coming up with logical ways of solving them I've already given you these key points at the start but evaluating effectiveness is important um, you should choose a particular framework and then apply it really stress that and then making good practical policy recommendations that a government will actually adopt is often hard that's the workshop uh, and that's us now until Thursday so uh, if you're coming on the field trip tomorrow I look forward to seeing you there at 8 o'clock uh, we'll have a really fun day if you're not coming on the field trip then obviously there's nothing on uh, tomorrow uh, and if you're able to come to lectures on Thursday great I look forward to seeing you then so we'll come back here at 9 o'clock on Thursday